Hi, this is Philosophy 81 and part three of our lectures on Hinduism. So far we have covered the development of the Aryan people and the Indus Valley people, how they came together, and um, the primary writings of the Aryan people became the primary religion also of the Indus Valley people. And eventually it led to the first classical form of Hinduism, which was the Karma Marga or the path of action. And it followed the rules in, in the Vedas that um, said, you know, by controlling your karma, not creating the bad karma, you could uh, get the reward of not having to come back in the samsara or rebirth cycle. They saw that that wasn't going to work as a, a, a infinite reward. And so they sought another method, which we moved into in part two with the, um, the Jnana Marga or the way of knowledge. Way of knowledge included a new writing called the Upanishads. And the Upanishads um, told about a secret knowledge that you could get only through this very deep meditative state called Samadhi where you communed with God and the secret knowledge or the Paramatika was put into your, your soul uh, directly and you realized then and understood and accepted that you were not separate from God. You were God. It was, uh, there were no separations. That was the, um, the, the uh, delusions that came from ignorance or Maya, and it made you think that you were separate, that there were separate people, but nope, it was not so. The secret teachings revealed that um, it was monist, one thing and one thing only, and that that was the reality. And of course, as soon as you realized that, um, you not only ceased to be, but so did your karma and your your um, responsibility for your karmic actions and thoughts. And so um, that was a goal and you went through the stages of life and uh, became a sannyasi and hopefully achieved samadhi. And then you got moksha or liberation because you realized there was nothing to be liberated from that we saw was difficult and not popular. <laughs> so now we move on to the third and final of the classical forms of Hinduism. It's called the Bhakti Marga and it is um, the path of devotion or the way of devotion. It developed um, in the late um, uh, first century BCE and the uh, first century common era or CE. So um, the Bhakti Marga changes it up from this, you know, um, there is n no separation to the belief that there is a separation between you and God and that your liberation or moksha could come through the power of a personal God, that the God had the ability to create karma and therefore he or she could break karma and end it. So, the word Brahman, which was the essential, um, uh, capital B, sorry, uh, Brahman was the essential essence of God. Now it is the, the universal power of God. So there is one universal power, one universal God, you could say. And, and so we now have moved it from what was polytheistic, many gods, to the view of monotheistic or one God. Everything comes from uh, Brahman. There are, however, two main versions of the Bhakti Marga. There's the, the Shevas and the Vaishnavas. Again, you should have your book handy so you can look, you know, recognize those written terms. Um, they don't conflict with each other because they're both viewed as versions of the Bhakti Marga where Brahman is the ultimate monotheistic God. The, the Shaivas worship a representation or a, you know, a, a God form of Brahman called Shiva and the Vaishnavas worship a God version called Vishnu but they are both from Brahman. So we've got a split and slightly different views, 
but basically they uh, all trace back to Brahman. So again, no conflict. Um, the Shaivas, again, worship Shiva. And Shiva was originally seen as a, a, a harsh god. He was the destroyer. And in Hinduism, destruction is not seen as a bad thing. For something new to come about, you have to destroy the old. So Shiva was the destroyer. However, he eventually becomes known as the friendly one because he cares about people. And the, the changes he's making uh, are to help people. So the destruction is a, a benevolent destruction. In the Shaivistic view, humans are deluded about their nature. So they're not, you know, they're not deluded into thinking that they are separate. They are separate but they're deluded about their nature and they see just their physical selves. It's like, it's all, you know, I, 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 my physical body is me and humans are unaware that God dwells in them. And so they're still bound to things like the laws of karma and samsara, the rebirth cycle and the illusions of ignorance that come from Maya. So we're, we're, not seen through the illusion, but the the illusion does not mean we don't exist. We do exist. We do have karma. We do have to follow the samsara cycle, but we need to commune to commune with God through worship. We need to worship God, whether it is puja, and that term is um, worship of idols, so images of of Shiva. Um, shrines to Shiva started appearing around the first century common era, and it was common for people to have these, um, drawings or figures, sculptures, whatever of, of Shiva as part of the shrine and they would, um, worship him. And, um, again, he was destructive, but had a kind side and he is, um, multifaceted. In other words, there are many different aspects to them. And one of the things that I was always curious about when I first started uh, um, questioning or learning about other religions like Hinduism was why the, the Hindu gods had multiple arms and legs and heads and, you know, there was just all sorts of stuff going on. So one of the prime examples of that is um, one of the images of Shiva. Uh, it's on page 70 in your textbook. So I'm going to hold it up here so you can see. And this is, um, uh, uh, let's see if it'll focus there. Okay. This is uh, Shiva, the dancer or the Raja. Um, and he has four arms and two legs and, and everything about that, including the number of arms and what the arms are doing has specific meaning. So if you look around him, there is this circle that has little, little flames around it. And that is just the, um, um, expression of spiritual power and, uh, and, and, and his godlikeness. When we also look at his left, his, the left hand that's more on the side, and I always have trouble pointing to things backwards in this camera here. Okay, so we're looking at this arm right here. His hand is out and he has in his hand uh, a, a little bit of fire. It's a little flame. This represents that he can destroy. So the ring of fire represents his spiritual um, power, but the fire that he holds in his hand represents that he is uh, able to destroy. He's not only seen as um, uh, a destroyer, He's also seen as the protector and the creator. So we have three main things about Shiva that are important. Destruction, preservation, and creation. So the number three is frequently associated with him. And you will see some of the members of his family have maybe three marks across the, the forehead or they're holding a trident with, you know, three prongs. But um, as far as his other arms, what we've got happening here, oops, okay. So his leg, this leg um, is up in the air 
and it represents that he is dancing. He is not just, you know, kind of doing a little, little shimmy. He is spinning and dancing, and there's a picture I, I prefer to use, but uh, it's in my office and locked up because of COVID, and it shows not only that the leg is up in the air because he's spinning in his dance, but the braids of his hair are spinning out. You know, it's like uh, the centrifugal force makes all of his hair flow out and he has a belt that is flowing out. So it's a very active dance. He's not just like letting the world go. He's actually through his dance continually creating the the universe. And if he stops dancing, the universe ends. So he doesn't necessarily have to actively destroy it through fire, but he can stop dancing. As long as he's dancing, he is maintaining um, the the universe. So back to the picture here, and um, sorry, okay. in his uh, his other hand, okay, or one of his other hands, in this first hand, uh, well, let's go with we'll continue with the left side. Sorry, um, this this arm that is pointed out that that is pointed to the ground and holding out um, your book says it's something like it's showing that he's accessible but actually that's not correct what that arm is the the arm that's handing out here is um, uh, a representation of the elephant trunk the elephant is the greatest most powerful animal in the world and so um, that arm sign, which you usually only see with Shiva, is the sign that he is the most powerful, the, the greatest good. Okay. Now that's, uh, that's his two left arms, but his right arm, one hand is holding um, a, a, a drum. And it's one of those little two-headed drums that kind of shaped like an hourglass, and they have little balls attached to the string, and you hold it in your hand like this, so you, around the waist of the drum, and you swing it back and forth like this. The strings hit the heads, and it creates a, a, a beat. Because sound is the source of creation. He makes the sound, so Shiva, Brahman, but Shiva, is the source of the sound, and the sound is the source of creation, and that also is maintaining the, the world. So it has two sides of, on the drum because it represents male and female. One of the things that you'll, you'll notice in representations of a lot of Hindu gods is that they may be male, but they have what we would consider some female characteristics, or they, they look kind of feminine, and, um, and that's intentional. That represents that, look, the world is made up of male and female. We need both. So the, they're seen as male gods because they are powerful, but they also have the female aspect. Um, they, he also has, um, and this is going to be really hard to see. I'm, in fact, I'm not sure if you can, if you can actually see it in this picture. No, you can't. In other representations of him, in his hair, there is a, a, a little woman. She's standing there, and she is the, um, the river goddess Ganja. Not Ganja like Bob Marley smoking weed, but Ganja is the name of the Ganges River, for example. She is the river goddess. And um, what happened is that one time <clears throat> she was over enthusiastic, I guess you could say, and she was causing rain and floods, and the people prayed to Shiva. And so he came to earth and used the braids of his hair to soak up all of the flood water. He dried up all of the water so that the people wouldn't be flooded out. And when he did that, he also trapped, trapped ganja in his hair. And um, that way he keeps tabs on her so that she won't make the floods come again. So he's protecting people by keeping um, uh, ganja under control. And the last hand, He's, he's got, it's, it's another uh, right hand, and it's hard to see, but it's, he's just holding his hand up like this. 
in Hinduism and um, Buddhism too, holding your hand up to face people is the sign of blessing. So you might see a, a monk or a nun who would would hold the, the hand up, and that is a, a blessing. And of course, we see that with a lot of uh, Hindu gods as well. They are blessing uh, the people. So he cares, right? And he is creating the world and his dances, preserving it, but he can destroy it. Now, you, all, you can't see in this picture at all because it's too small. Uh, hopefully you'll go online and look up pictures of uh, the dancing um, uh, Shiva or Nataraja and uh, get a better better picture. Um, COVID has locked mine up. But anyway, you can't see it in this picture, but he has three eyes. So there are the two normal eyes that people have, but he has a third eye right up here. So his normal eyes represent the sun and the moon. But the center eye is um, a fire. So the eyes represent creation from the sun eye, the protection or the you know preservation from the moon eye, and then this fire eye in the center represents destruction. So again, we keep getting these images of the three aspects of Shiva. The fire eye. Uh, the eyelid is always closed because if he opens that up, beams of fire and light come out and it destroys everything within uh, the, you know, the view of that eye, basically. So he is dancing and preserving us through that dance, but ever so often he stops dancing. He just stops dancing and everything in the universe ends. And when he decides, he will start up a new dance and start the creation of the world or the universe over. It may be um, an exact copy of what was just destroyed, but it may also be something entirely different, a new rhythm, a new beat, a new dance. And, um, and we would never know because we would probably be created brand new as well, and we have no way of the many, many, many universes that have come before. Um, so Shiva, since he protects us and can um, uh, destroy things, he can certainly destroy karma, because after all, it's the power of Brahman that we see through Shiva that um, created karma. So we would choose somebody like, um, or, or Shiva, um, to worship in hopes that he would rid of us of our karma. He is separate because he is the ruler of everything. So you are not him. You can commune with him. Some of his spirit dwells within you. But there is definitely a separation between ruler and the ruled, or, or you. Um, if, in fact, if you were to do what the people in the Nyana Marga did and say, uh, you know, I am God, um, in the, the Shaivistic version or, or view, it would be seen as, as, as very impious and, um, and, and just wrong. So um, we have the three sides of him. We have the three aspects of him. Again, people tend to identify um, with sides of three. I have another picture that um, I'll show you here. Um, it's, it's fairly popular. This is Ganesha. So um, Ganesha is the son of, of Shiva. And if you look at him, he's got the body of a, a human or a boy, and he has the head of an elephant. But he also has four hands, and um, and he's holding things in each hand. He's sitting on his throne because he's the son of Shiva, so he's essentially a a a, a, a prince. And um, just like there are many different versions of Shiva that show different aspects of him, there are many different versions of Ganesha, uh, about ninety, and. 
he is viewed as the one who can clear obstacles and that he he protects knowledge. So um, if you are a student, this would be a good um, a good one to worship. If you are you know you have a uh, a library or a lot of books, he would protect those books. He would uh, you know again protect um, the knowledge. He he loves the idea of education, he would protect that, would help you along in your studies. You also see him at a lot of Hindu-owned stores because he clears obstacles. So he would be, uh, uh, there would be a statue of him or a painting or whatever of him in a lot of new Hindu-owned stores because um, it shows that he is there to, uh, of course, protect them and their knowledge, but to clear the obstacles of business. So, you know, might bring in customers or, you know, whatever it is, is. he's really just here to help us. And there's an interesting story about how he came to be and, um, and what all of these different things in his, his arms uh, and hands are. So let me tell you the story. Shiva has um, several wives. And one of the first ones that gets identified identified is named Parvati. Now he and Parvati lived together, and um, you know were happy. It was the uh, his primary marriage. And um, he said, "I'm going to go off and meditate." And she said, "Okay, I'm going to take a bath." And so he goes off, but now she's a little concerned because she's home alone and she's going to take a bath. So she takes a stick and she scrapes off all of the dirt and the mud and, you know, all of the dead flesh and whatever off of herself. And she puts it all together and makes a son, a boy. And his name is Ganesha. But he has the head of a human. And she tells him, stay outside the door here and guard it and don't let anybody come in while I take a bath. And the boy is doing what he's told when Shiva comes back. Well, he doesn't know who Shiva is. And, um, I mean, he's just a newborn little boy, but actually he's big. You know, anyway, so he, he tries to stop Shiva from coming into the house. And Shiva's like, this is my house. I'm Shiva. And, um, and the boy is protecting his mother. And so he draws a sword on Shiva. He's like, no, you, you can't come in. Shiva being Shiva is like, yes, I can, pulls out his sword and chops off the head of the boy. Now about this time, Parvati comes out and she sees what's happening and or happened. And she's like, oh my God, you just killed our son. And she was like, I didn't, I, I didn't know. Right. And so she's very aggrieved. And um, Shiva says, I will fix this. Um, the next animal that or the next living thing that comes from the forest or comes out of the forest, I will take its head and put it on the boy. So it happens to be that the next animal that comes through is an elephant. So he chops the head off of an elephant and he sticks it on the boy. And now the boy is alive with the head of an elephant and the body of a boy. I don't understand why if he has that kind of power, he just didn't take the boy's head and stick it back on and bring it back to life. But I didn't write this story. So now we have a god here named Ganesha. And he's got the uh, body of a boy uh, and the head of an elephant. One of the things that we can identify right off is that up here, yeah, okay, so up here, he has a third eye and it's protected by um, a, his head decoration. And that identifies him as part of the, the Shiva family, the Shiva clan. He has that third eye. Um, he's also holding a couple of interesting things. Now in this hand right here, um, that it kind of looks like a carrot, but it's one of his tusks. If you look over here, you'll see that his tusk, oops, there we go this way is his his tusk is broken whereas the one on the other side is not broken part of the story is that when shiva shop, chopped the head off of uh, uh the elephant that was coming through when the head fell to the ground the the tusk broke so ganesha is holding his broken tusk so that it keeps him complete um we have here around his middle the uh a snake a naga 
It's a, a belt that is made out of a snake, and it shows just this idea that he has um, power over other living things. More importantly is that we have, again, let's see if I can do this, okay, this lasso over here. And the lasso is, um, is the idea that he can, he can uh, lasso or, you know, capture ignorance and, uh, and help remove it because, Again, ignorance is a, a cause of the, of the well, you know, it's the root of all evil. It is the cause of all the problems. Below that, in this other hand right here, um, it's a little ball of sweet meat. Sweet meat is essentially like the mince meat from a mince meat pie. It is, it is, you know, chopped up meat that has been cooked and candied. And he carries that around because, you know, he's a little fat boy and he likes to have a little snack. So, you know, he's got a hand, might as well carry it around. Last, but perhaps most importantly, is this hand up here. This is a representation, or supposed to be a representation, of the elephant hook. An elephant hook does not really look like this. An elephant hook, for the most part, is a, a stick that has a, a hook or a spike on the end of it. It's very sharp and it's very thick and it is used by elephant trainers to get the elephants to do what they want. So if they want an elephant to do something and they give it a command and they prod it with a stick and the elephant isn't responding, they keep hitting it with this point, I mean this spike, this on the end of the, um, uh, the, the, the hook or the hook itself. And um, sometimes you will see cases where you know, uh, elephants are, are just bloodied because they have been hit so many times with that stick because the trainer is trying to get them to learn to do something stupid like stand on a platform and balance a ball for a circus. And it's, it's, a, it's an awful uh, practice. And, and personally, whenever I read a story about an elephant having trampled a trainer, I'm rooting for the elephant because the, the way they train them is horrible when elephants are indeed very um, smart and have a great deal of feeling. So it's not like, you know, it's not just feelings of pain, but emotional feelings. So, so he is a, a co-protector, I guess you could say, of, of people and living things. Um, he has some pictures or there are pictures of him where he has one leg hanging off his little cushion there and it is swinging. And it swings in the same rhythm with his, his father, Shiva. So they're also doing the dance. Sometimes you see him with a drum or some other thing as well. Now, you may be wondering about this little guy down here at the bottom. This is um, a, a, a mouse. And uh, he's having a little snack, too. He's got some sort of little nut or something there. But the rat is Ganesha's ride. When Ganesha needs to go someplace, he gets on the uh, not a rat, um, the mouse and rides on the back of the mouse, and um, it's kind of funny because you know one of the mythologies that have passed through many cultures is that the only thing elephants are afraid of are the um, the uh, are, are mice, and so here he is riding a mouse, and again shows ma mastery over all things. Many other different gods, and also um, a number of wives. So we have this overall idea that Shiva is the most powerful god. He protects us. He created karma. He can he can uh, destroy karma if necessary, and he can. Um, do all the things that we need so we worship him. And in around um, uh, around the time that the Bhakti Marga was being written, and actually a little bit before, in like uh, even the second and third century BCE, uh, a, a story was written called the Bhagavad Gita. We frequently just call it the Gita because Bhagavad Gita is hard to say, but it tells the story of um, some of uh, uh, Shiva's wives, particularly uh, his wife, not only Parvati,
but Durga and Kali. Durga is, is now seen as the main active part of Shiva. So she's kind of a wife. She's kind of the, the female constructive side um, of Shiva. But she is, you know, she is seen as his wife sometimes, but she's much more than, you know, just a wife. Uh, whereas Parvati was uh, more traditional in the sense of she was Shiva's wife. Uh, Durga is is kind of the one that determines the, the, the course of the natural universe. So if Shiva's creating it, the side of him that is Durga is the one that's saying this is how it's going to be. So she, she becomes very important as one of the, the gods that could be uh, followed. We also see Kali. Kali you may be familiar with. She is um, destructive, basically. She is another one of Shiva's wife. But she subjugates him completely. In fact, you frequently see pictures of her and she's standing on top of him. He's lying there on the ground. And she has um, black skin and fangs with blood running out of her mouth. She holds swords and um, leg bones and arm bones. And her skirt is made out of um, a bunch of leg bones. I mean, she's a very vicious looking character. And if you've seen it, uh, some of the Indiana Jones movies, there's a section where section where they they got this priest that's ripping hearts out by his hands, and and they're praying to Kali, and and they get the whole um, religious religious aspect of that wrong. But some of sometimes the name is borrowed for uh, entertainment purposes. But she is definitely uh, one of the the main parts in in Shaivism. So we have Durga and Kali and Parvati. Those would be the three most known. There's another one that doesn't get talked about too often, but her name is Uma, U-M-A, just like Uma Thurman. And Uma Thurman is named Uma because her father, Robert Thurman, is um, or was the, the head of the Department of Religious Studies at um, I think it was Cornell. I'm not sure now. I'm sorry. Um, but he was big in the field of religious studies, and he intentionally named his daughter Irma, uh, Irma, Uma to be named after the Hindu goddess. Um, so that's where her unusual name comes. But one of the problems that people ran into was that um, they were like, well, if it doesn't come from the Vedas, we can't really say that it's authentic. If it, if it doesn't come from the Vedas, then how, how do we know this isn't just some sort of made up thing? So what they did is they looked at the characteristics of Shiva, and then they looked at the characteristics of the various gods in the Vedas, and they said, you know what? Shiva is actually Rudra. Rudra was the god of storms. They called him the Howler. Um, and he is written about in the Vedas. And so they said, look, Shiva and Rudra are the same. And they described him. You know, they both have this red face and a blue bulging neck. And the, the bulging neck, com neck comes from the story of uh, some of the demons were trying to, uh, uh, gods, demons, were trying to get rid of humans. And so they poisoned the ocean of milk, uh, which is a metaphor, of course. And, um, and then they grabbed a snake by the tail and they stirred it up and used the snake whipping around like a big mixer to mix the poison in with uh, the ocean of milk. And, and so Rudra, who is now Shiva, came to earth and came down and swallowed all of the poison that was in the ocean of, of milk and therefore saved people. That's why his neck is bulging because it was a lot of poison. So he's, he's red and blue again, because the poison has affected him and, um, and his bulging neck. So it's just as another story that shows how he 
um, <coughs> uh, is a protector. As far as views, in terms of how are they different from any of the other forms of, of Hinduism, well, they still are seeking moksha or liberation. They still are following, following the ashramas, the stages of life. They recognize samsara, the, the rebirth cycle, but they are recognizing their existence and they are saying, look, we can choose one of these gods and that god, he or she, will um, break our karma and we will not have to come back if we do the proper worship. So it was um, of a view that well is a view that um, originally was was practiced by some of the people who had a harder life because um, they could see that well you know this hardness in my life um, things that are painful or, or destructive are necessary so things can be better. They also liked the fact that that Shiva was a uh, protector who would take care of them. So a lot of the the lower levels on the caste system followed followed Shiva. The other path was uh, the Vaishnavas, and they had a different view of of their god. So with the Vaishnavas, they uh, um, immediately trace the the um, the origin or the um, person or the, the god uh, Vishnu, um, I mean he's in the Vedas. So they worship Vishnu. Now if you remember the story about the cosmogony, Vishnu was the god who went before Bali and asked to step off three realms and then uh, then marked off the three huge steps and uh, created you know the mysterious heavens and the atmosphere and the earthly disk. So Vi Vishnu already existed in the Vedas. Um, but how does that factor into this new view of, of there being an ultimate God, not just, you know, the separate gods that did things? And um, it, well, it, it happens because of influence from a group of people called the Sadavadas. So the Sadavadas were a non-Aryan tribe that were um, around in roughly the 5th century BCE. So by the time classical Hinduism is getting, a, you know, or the Bhakti Marga is getting um, a good foothold in roughly the, the 1st century, the Sadavadas had been around for four or 500 years and having interaction with uh, the Aryan people and the Indus Valley people. And they worshipped a god named Krishna. Now Krishna was not in um, the Vedas. He was not a god of the, the Aryan people. He was purely a god of the Sadavadas. But over time as the Sadavadas became influential and they rose to the rank, the caste of, of uh, Kshatriyas, they began to influence the Brahmins. At that point the, the Brahmins were um, um, monist, right? They were following the Jnana Marga and they were like, there's just all one and, you know, there's no separation between God. But the Sadavadas were monotheistic. They worshipped one God and that God were, um, that God was uh, Krishna. As the f two religions kind of came together or, or the Sadavadas worship of Krishna became uh, an influence to the Brahmins, the view on um, the Jnana Marga was disappearing. So now we're following in line with this idea of there is a God that you can worship, a personal God. It can be Shiva, it can be Vishnu, and Vishnu is the God when he's in heaven. But when he comes to earth he takes on different personas. They're called avatars. And one of them is Krishna. So they validate um, Krishna as a god by saying he is one of the avatars of Vishnu. I'll explain that a little bit more, so don't worry quite yet. 
we get the story of what was going on and and Krishna the story of Krishna through um, this book the Bhagavad Gita and it has these um, you know stories of the different gods and what was going on and the story that applies here I mean it also told us about Durga and Kali but the story that applies here is that there was this warrior named Arjuna and he was a prince his, his father was a, a, um, a king well on the other side of the valley um, was another kingdom that was run by his uncle so his dad's brother two brothers two different kingdoms and they didn't really agree the two brothers they um, they both wanted to take over the land of each other so there was a battle and the armies of the two kingdoms were lined up on the top of the or the hills over this valley and they're looking down into the valley and they're going to go into this valley and have a bloody hand-to-hand -hand combat uh, you know arrows perhaps whatever battle but Arjuna is the the prince who was in charge of his family side and his cousin is the the prince that's on the other side that he's in charge of or in charge of that that group of warriors and Arjuna is is fairly sensitive I mean he's he's worried he's he's concerned about the fact that well what's this going to do to my karma because I'm just about to go uh, order and uh, a bunch of people to get killed by my soldiers and my soldiers will be killed and then secondly he was like uh, you know I I, I don't want to kill some these people are relatives really you know so I, I don't want to do that I don't know what to do well <clears throat> Arjuna's chariot driver turns out um, to be the god Krishna and Krishna says well let me let me talk to you about this he says you know when you kill a body it really doesn't do any harm because the soul is not killed the soul, the soul moves on to the next body so you're not really doing any harm and you could remain your karma could remain untarnished if the killing is done in service to God and your king and um, so we get this idea that look I can go into war I can kill even if they're my relatives because my religion demands it my king demands it and I am essentially being a good servant or a good soldier it's not me I don't want to go kill them right I am following the orders in service to God and country and so my karma isn't harmed and the people who are killed aren't harmed because again you can't kill the soul they just move on to the next body so this view um, from Krishna, this revelation you could call it, from Krishna is um, something that uh, Arjuna takes to heart. He goes into battle and he is freed from any karmic retribution from going into battle. So we have Krishna as an active God who comes to earth. He represents Vishnu who's in heaven, but he is um, one of the, the ten avatars. And the avatars are um, the, uh, the, the main difference in Vishnu, the Vaishnavas and the Shaivites and anyone else. So we've got Krishna. We have uh, a, a movement in fact that is very large even today called the Hare Krishna where Krishna becomes that God that people are worshiping however they're actually worshiping Vishnu which means they're actually worshiping Brahman. So the avatars the avatars are ten different beings that come to or have come to earth um, to solve problems and they are all Vishnu in a different form. They come to earth to solve the you know, problems and to restore Dharma. Remember Dharma means sacred duty. So they want to get everything um, in, in line and 
And for the Vaishnavas, this plays into that you pick one of them as your personal um, god to worship who can then break your karma. Um, I think some of the stories are different, so the, uh, are interesting. So the very first avatar of Vishnu that came to Earth was part man and part fish. Um, so a, a mermaid, basically. And the reason he was in that form was because the world was mostly water. And um, so he needed to be part fish so he could do what he needed to do, you know. And there's uh, an avatar. Mm, this is my favorite. So there was a demon on earth one time who said, I am the most powerful, I'm, you know, demon, I am the most powerful of all the, the gods. And uh, he said, no one, no one can kill me. Not, not inside, not outside, um, not not day or night and um oh there's one more and let me think i can't remember it now this is funny let me pause okay maybe there are only two because i can't seem to remember the third but he's making this boast that no one can kill him and so um oh i know just remember the third one <laughs> he says not man nor beast so he cannot be killed by man or beast um inside or outside day or night. He's impervious to everything. So Vishnu comes to earth as a half man, half lion. And he comes right at twilight, right at, at dusk. And he goes to the door of the, the house where this demon is and he calls to the demon and the demon comes and he's standing in the doorway. So here's what happened. The demon is standing in the doorway. He's not inside or outside. It's dusk. It's not night and it's not day. It's right in between. And this half lion, uh, half man Vishnu is not man nor beast. So um, he he meets all of the qualifications, you know, that, that weren't supposed to happen. So he winds up grabbing the demon and he just guts him. He takes his lion paw with all the claws and he just rips that guy's op the guy open. And sometimes you will see statues of Vishnu as, as this avatar. And, um, and he'll be holding, you know, with one arm, the, the body of the demon and all the guts are hanging out and everything. And just shows, yep, don't try and mess with Vishnu because if you're messing with the world, you're messing with Vishnu and he will come down and punish you in whatever form he needs to. And there were other forms. There was, I think, a turtle one and so forth. But the human ones are, are the ones that you can choose to actually worship or the better ones to, to worship. So we had Krishna, which I've been talking about. And Krishna was um, the seventh avatar. avatar. There are ten. Um, Krishna is the seventh avatar. Rama, um, another version of, of Vishnu, was number eight. The Buddha is number nine. And that's an interesting thing because that, that really is saying, look, Buddhists are Hindu and they just are worshiping the Buddha avatar of Vishnu. And really, um, Buddhists are uh, part of the Bhakti Marga. Uh, I don't think Mm, uh, Buddhists would agree with that, but it's an interesting concept that they incorporate into the system of avatars people that have, you know, influenced the religion and the world, and they've got this idea of Buddha being an avatar. The tenth and last avatar hasn't come yet. Um, the last one is Kalki, and he is seen as this this guy riding a, a white horse that is rearing up and he's got a sword in his hand and he's got a big mustache and you know flowing black hair and he's just like the perfect manly prince you know and he will come and he will uh, eliminate ignorance again ignorance is the primary problem of well everything but he will come and and um uh, eliminate ignorance and and enlighten us all to the ways of the Bhakti Marga. It is not a problem within the Bhakti Marga to worship any or several of the avatars. They're all versions of 
vishnu so it, it, it's kind of like saying look um you know i i worship this god and today he's wearing a blue shirt and you know i also have this picture of him over here in a green shirt and that that kind of it's fine it's the same god and so the the different avatars um are just representations of vishnu but they have different um um personalities Krishna is probably the most popular. I think I said that before. And um, he is seen as very playful. There's a story in your textbook about how he he plays the flute and teases the, the goat herding girls who all fall in love with him. And he keeps appearing and disappearing. And they're like, why are you messing with us? But he is... Um, he is joyous and playful and so he's popular because people want to think of uh, the person that they're worshiping as being someone that's happy they are seeking happiness right Rama is also um, popular Rama came after Krishna and there's a story that doesn't come around till about the fourth century uh, um, and it's the Ramayana and so it's compatible uh, or com comparable to the uh, Mahabharata and the Bhagavad Gita in the time period. But it tells the story of Rama, who was very heroic, and um, his wife Sita is the the model of virtue. I mean, she is loyal and she takes you know does her 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 duty you know seriously and and does it. She's She's very virtuous, and um, Sita is, today is still a a, a popular name of uh, Hindu girls. So uh, there's a story, and she's kidnapped, and Rama goes after her, and um, the Ramayana. It's it's you know it's an epic poem or epic story, and a lot of what we have developing during this time of classical Hinduism are these writings that are. Um, essentially the history of India. the They get collected into the Mahabharata and that gives us, uh, you know, every important story, like every important story that was ever written by uh, anyone about India. And so it talks about the various things that have been done by the, the avatars, especially Krishna and Rama. But uh, it's got the Bhagavad Gita contained in there, and uh, lots of lots of stories. Um, as far as the worldview and how it's different from the Shaivas, well, it's not that different. You just have a different set of versions of Brahman, either the the Shiva family line or the Vishnu family line. One way or the other, it's all about Brahman. You're all you're you're worshiping him. He is the ultimate god, and you can you know basically worship the version you choose. There's no real conflict between the Shaivites and the Vaishnavas, or with any of the of Vaishnavas and the different avatars. They're all Brahmin, so it's okay um, to to worship the the, the pantheon really, um, but. Ideally, you would choose one, and that one would would be one you would develop a personal relationship with, commune with regularly, worship, uh, show devotion, make offerings, and those kind of things. And if you follow the ashramas and live your life right, you don't have to go to the sannyasi stage or even the forest dweller stage. You would just do all of the studying and um, perfect your moral virtues. And and understand that uh, you know God can dwell in you, so you need to commune uh, commune with God. And if you do that, and you ask this personal God that you have been worshiping to break through your karma, he or she will, and then you are freed from the samsara cycle. The bhakti marga is the most popular form of, of Hinduism. Hinduism, It is the last of the versions that we'll be co uh, covering because there really wasn't much after that. This version was popular and has stuck around. This is the version that is being practiced today. The Karma Marga and the Jnana Marga 
aren't completely forgotten. Um, followers of the Karma Marga, who didn't try one of the other paths, tended to be at attracted to a, um, a new religion called Jainism. We don't talk about Jainism in the course. There is a chapter on it in your textbook if you're, if you're interested. And it's about living a life that is, is you know, very focused on controlling your karma. Um, secondly, the people who followed the Jnana Marga seem to have also drifted into a, another religion or some of those ideas, even though they, they came about at the same time. Um, and they are uh, essentially followers of the Avatar Buddha. So we see a lot of connections between the Jnana Marga and Buddhism. Buddhism actually came first, so we, we you know, the Hindus are going to say, look, we've got this idea, and we've got this avatar that's, that's Buddha, and, you know, the Buddhists are going to go be, uh, you know, Hindu offshoots. The Buddhists wouldn't look at it that, that way. They would say, look, um, the Buddha discovered the secrets of Buddhism, and that spread into Hinduism. Who knows? It was 2,500 years ago. Except we do know that Buddhism came before the Bhakti Marga. Okay, so um, um, we have those two versions. I've, uh, I I, I want to just make sure we're kind of clear. I'm going to actually send out a PDF file of uh, vocabulary terms. So I'm, I'm going to wait a couple days because I don't want you to have it while you're watching the videos. I mean, you can go back and watch the videos, of course, but the the idea here is that you read the material, you watch the videos, and then you're able to look at this vocabulary list and go, yeah, I know what puja means. I, I know what this means. I know, you know, and, and you can test your knowledge that way because that means then you're going to be ready for the test. And then you will still have uh, time, a day or two, to look at that list and uh and say, I need, I don't know what this is, and then you can go back and refresh by reading the material or looking at that portion of the, um, uh, the lectures. Okay. This essentially wraps up our section on Hinduism. Because again, there have been very few changes since the Bhakti Marga. Yes, every single temple, every single group that that practices uh, a religion, including Hinduism, will practice it slightly different. So you've got the one temple that's over here in one part of the country and another one that's in this other part of the country, and there are slight variations. But they have to do with the variations um, of that individual group. So we don't really talk about them as being changes in the religion because they they can be you know, uh, very, very simple things like, well, we meet on such and such a day, whereas everybody else meets, you know. Uh, I mean, think of it like the, the Christian church, um, if, if you want to make a comparison. You know, most Christian church services are on Sunday morning. But some of them will say, no, we don't do Sunday morning. We want to do Saturday or, we, you know, th there'll be a change. Those things vary from church to church, and that's okay. That's the pluralities of religious, uh, religious, religiousness. You have groups that you belong to, and if you don't like some of the ideas in that group, you maybe go to a group that has ideas that you like more, you know, that fit with your thinking. So we see, of course, the split between uh, uh, Catholic and Protestant, you know, and some of the ideas. And then, of course, there are a whole bunch of different versions of Catholic and a whole bunch of different versions of Protestant. And this Protestant group says, oh, divorce, you know, we're all kind of okay with it. And the Catholics are like, oh, no, we're not okay with that. And then this other Protestant group says, yeah, we're fine with it, you know, or, or we're fine with gay people. But then this other Protestant group says, nope, nope, they're going to go to hell, right? So you've got that variation from church to church. You have the same thing from temple to temple or group to group within Hinduism. And we're going to see as we move through the rest of the religions uh, that we'll be covering this semester that we have 
a, a, you know, a plurality of belief systems. So I've given you the main thrust of Hinduism and uh, ideas of its origin and its beliefs and tenets and how it, how it developed and the practices today. And that's what we will continue to do. So um, I guess I will wrap up. It's been an hour and I know that's a long video to watch. So that wraps up Hinduism and we will move on to Buddhism next.